Hello and welcome to the first episode of Did You Know Bible Studies every Thursday with me, Pearl. So to begin with the this episode, let's start with a short prayer, right? So, Father, we bow our heads in prayer that you open our minds and our hearts for a deeper understanding of your word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Right, so today... Um, um, as I promised you guys, I'm going to take you through Genesis 1 to 5, okay? Now, you know I have been studying for five years, all right? I have learned Hebrew and I've learned Greek and I've read the scriptures in these original languages in which they were originally written. So, Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, did you know that the Torah starts with in Hebrew, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim vayet haaretz. Right? Because the heavens is shamayim, okay? Earth is eretz, all right? So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, you may say that this is a um, uh, very sort of uh, self-observant, uh, you know, it's, it's self-explanatory, you could say, right? But do you know people have spent lifetime studying this one verse because because Hebrew is an alphanumeric language and this adds up to various codes, all right? There are many codes in this first verse of Genesis and I have been studying it for a while and I have found codes in it. But the most astounding thing, the most astounding revelation from this that I have received is that the entire Torah is a quest for home. A home for us and a home for God. Home is where the heart is, you see. Just four walls and a roof does not, you know, it can be called a house, but a home is different. It's where your loved ones are, where you're surrounded by love and kindness and happiness, comfort and good humor. It denotes the warmth of a loving family, the warmth of God, okay, it denotes the family of God. But the Torah takes this quest for a home to another level altogether. And do you know what I realized from this? That God wants the perfect home for you, for me, and for him. And nothing less will do. How do we know this? Because the entire magnificent Torah holds a million mysteries, acrostics, and codes. And yet, and yet, it starts with the Hebrew alphabet bet which is the second alphabet lf is the first so this entire torah starts with bereshit okay bereshit para elohim et hashamayim vayet haaretz it could have started with lf but god chose to start it with bet all right and i want to show you why bet is um, such an interesting you know bet in um, in ancient uh, paleo hebrew Okay, in the pictographs, Bet is uh, the letter Bet means a house. Okay, Aleph is the primary principle. Okay, so I'll just read this out actually to you. So, the Torah does not start as one would expect it to with the primary alphabet Aleph because in ancient Hebrew pictographs, Bet denoted a home or a house, and Aleph denotes the primary principle, the creator, okay, God Himself. The symbology of the ox in ancient Hebrew in the pictograph format. The hidden code here is that the creator of all things is creating a home not only for his creation, but also a home which will in due course of time become his home, his place of residence. Now this is given to us in Revelation 21.3. Right? I'll just read that out. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. What a great promise. In a sense, God is revealing his heart and his ultimate plan in the very first sentence of Genesis. Now you can read Revelation chapters 21 and 22 to better understand this concept of a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. You know, it says new heaven and new earth, but the word in Hebrew means renewed. The same earth that is renewed. The same heaven that is renewed okay it's not something brand new all right like if you buy a pen uh you buy it brand new right but if it's the same pen let's say the ink runs out 
you have to change the you you change the cartridge and it becomes the renewed pen okay so this concept of a renewed heaven and a renewed earth where god lives with men also read ezekiel 40 to 48 and then see the last verse of ezekiel it's verse 35 okay this this earth will become a dwelling of the lord and the name of his city will be the lord is here now again in hebrew it denotes a continuous present tense as in permanently but till it happens till the lord makes this his home okay all the way from genesis to revelation we are promised plenty of drama and adventure right okay now we come to verse 2 which is again amazing and so interesting and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters so here we've got four things i want you to look at one is form one is like there's without form void darkness and the face of the deep let's look at this sentence first we'll come to spirit of god later right now it translates transliterates as vahares haeta tohu va bohu tohu va bohu okay so without form is tohu and void is bohu tohu va bohu now what does it mean tohu means a desolation a wasteland a nothingness something in confusion orderless in chaos and the word bohu means ruined and empty okay so it gives a very bleak picture of what the earth was like before god came and fluttered his uh, spirit over the the deep dark darkness that was there before okay and the word darkness this one okay and darkness was upon the face of the deep this word darkness is hoshek all right so hoshek meaning destruction ignorance wickedness reflecting misery death and sorrow it's a very deep dark word all right it's not an ordinary word for let's say a place without light but it goes deeper hoshek means destruction ignorance wickedness reflecting misery death and sorrow and the word for deep is tehom meaning an abyss or the deepest main subterranean sea you know of recently scientists have found that under the earth's crust yes we know there's magma but below that layer there is a deep subterranean ocean which is so vast and so deep this deeper than if you put all the seas together it has more water okay this is referring to that the abyss the home okay it's the deepest main subterranean sea then we have the spirit of god or ruach okay spirit is ruach you all know that the spirit of god or the ruach moved now moved in hebrew is rahef okay rahef means to flutter okay it's like a moving it's like a fluttering the spirit of god the ruach of god fluttered okay it fluttered upon the face of the waters now the word waters in here is maim and you know maim is not regular water not the water you and i know you know when we think of water we think of something clean sparkling beautiful you know but mahim is the exact opposite this waters means urine waste water and also it's a euphemism for something quite dirty and disgusting in effect extremely unclean water mahim is filthy contaminated and defiled okay so here we go so you know what tohu va bohu is all right so vaharets haeta tohu va bohu vahasek the darkness okay the destructive darkness vahasek alpane va ruhak ruhak is the spirit okay ruhak elohim marahafet uh, that is rahafet you know i i just explained that to you right it fluttered okay the ruhak fluttered alpane hamaim now maim as i mentioned is extremely dirty like it's not any water that you would even bathe in or drink it's extremely unclean water okay so the spirit of god fluttered over this unclean water and god said let there be light and there was light and god saw the light that it was good and god divided the light from the darkness and god called the light day and the darkness he called night 
and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, did you know that God said, let there be light? This word light, or, okay, or meaning illumination, but it has other connotations. It does not just mean light, like switch on a bulb and there's light. No, it is illumination, bright, clear, happiness on the first day. Now, he did this. He said, let there be light, even before he created the sun, as the sun was created on the fourth day. Hence, this light mentioned in Genesis 1, 3, 3 to 5, it refers to the divine Shekinah glory of the Lord that is represented by the central pillar of the menorah. The number four also represents Christ, the Son of God, who is the light of the world. Read John 8, 12. Also, Malachi the prophet calls him the Son of Righteousness. Malachi 4, 2. The son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings, right? Four is also Dalet, the fourth alphabet, okay, in Hebrew. And it is the symbol of the open door, all right? The pictograph of Dalet is the symbol of the open door. And Jesus says, I am the door, okay, in John 9, 10, 9. And four is also, as I mentioned, the central pillar, the fourth pillar of the servant candle um, of the menorah, from whichever side you count okay the right or the left you will see that it is in the middle all right let me just show that to you in fact hang on i have it open here um just a minute just a minute i'll just get it okay so here it is you can see this is the menorah and this is the shekinah glory of god the central pillar okay now if you count from this side it's one two three four right and from this side, one, two, three, four, and it represents the glory of God, and it also represents Christ, the Son of God, right? So getting back to this, all right? So now we see, uh, and God said, let there be a firmament, firmament uh, in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Okay, now the firmament here is rakia, meaning the visible arch of the sky, okay? And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and it, the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, Eretz, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Now, this word seas, okay, mentioned here is Yom, okay, not to be men not to be confused with Yom, like is, as in Yom Kapoor, that means day, but this is Yom, meaning to roar as in a breaking noisy surf on a large body of water, very different from Maim. You remember Maim is this filthy, contaminated, you know, defiled water, hmm? but seas is Yom, and this has a very different con connotation from Maim. Right, so he brought something amazing. All right, he turned the waters into the seas. All right, and uh, which is, as I mentioned, the breaking noisy surf on a large body of water when you're on a beach. This is what you see. All right, now, did you know that verses 11 to 12? Oh, I haven't even read this. Okay, and God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree and yielding fruit after its kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. So did you know that verses 11 to 12 contain a scientific reference to DNA, whose seed is in itself, seed after its own kind, after its kind, and this is also repeated in verses 21, 24, and 25. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Now, did you know that the third day is known as the day of double blessings? As God said, it was good twice in verses 10 and 12. And hence, many Jewish weddings are held on Tuesdays, which is the third day from the Shabbat. Okay, the Shabbat begins Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. All right. Now, did you know that in verse 14, the word night here is lail or layala, meaning night. But, you know, it also means adversity. 
Now take a look at John 4. You know when Jesus says that one can work while there's day, when the night comes, you cannot work, okay? Which means adversity, all right? So night and adversity have very um, sort of interlinked uh, meanings in the Torah. So now if you see the word signs, all right? So you have uh, the day from the night and signs. The word signs, H226, is oth, okay? It means a signal or a nomen. Okay, and seasons, the word seasons is moed or moedim in plural. Okay, it means a divine appointment as appointed beforehand, an assembly, a congregation and or a place of divine meeting. Also moed is a festival or a celebration. So it has all these different meanings. Okay, but I think uh, this meaning a divine appointment as appointed beforehand is very, very interesting. Okay, and for seasons, all right. So you have signs, all right? So you have for signs, for seasons, okay? And for days and for years. Now here, as you know, the word day is Yom, you know, as in Yom Kippur, or the day of atonement, or the day of judgment, as you know, there's so many uh, places where Yom is used. So, and the word for year is Shane. Okay, Shane can also represent an age. Also a period of time as a revolution of time, as in a year, but it could also mean a, an age, okay? And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And Job, in the book of Job, it tells us he knows the name of each and every star, right? He has named them all. Now, did you know that the greater light is again an allusion to the light of the world? It's an allusion. It means it refers to the light of the world, Christ, the anointed one. And the lesser light is lesser because it has no light of its own, like the moon, which only lights up when it reflects the light of the sun, right? Hmm? It, in divine terms, it could be referring to the light of the world and the son of righteousness, Christ, okay? The greater light and the lesser light are those of us the believers who reflect his glory on earth and reflect his like light in a dark world the lower earthly realm as it is referred to in rabbinic literature the earth is referred to as the lower earthly realm okay in uh, rabbinic literature it's like one of the lowest worlds and so we have the sun okay christ and his light and the lesser lights those of us believers we don't have light of our own, but we can reflect his glory and his light on this dark world. Okay, in this dark world. And God set them, set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Ah, now the fourth, Rebbe E, -E okay, Rebbe E means four square, as in four winds, Four corners, four dimensions, four rivers, four alignments, north, south, east, west. The fourth day again refers to, you know, Dalet, the door, Christ, okay, which is the fourth alphabet. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that had life and fowl that may fly up above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales. And every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. So remember I told you that this is a reference to DNA in uh, verse 24 and 25 again. So everything after its own kind, like it had its own seed within it. It could procreate. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Oh, this is where it gets very interesting because I've done so much. I've studied so much into this, as most of you know. But if you're new to this channel, then this is something that is amazing. It's mind-blowing. Did you know that the fish were created on the fifth day? And the fifth day corresponds to 153 fish, the eternal fish, or the full net. 153 brought in by Simon Peter and the other disciples in John 21:11, Also depicted in the equation of iterations of 
Jesus or Jesus in Greek, which adds up to 888. When you raise it to the power of the Trinity, you get this equation. Now you see that the first day you get 369. Now this is very interesting because you know Nikola Tesla, he said that this universe is based on 369, which is this world, this dimension. But do you know when you come to the fifth day, okay, when the fish was fish were created and the 153 fish, why did they choose 153 was not a random number just put in the Bible. There's a deep, deep significance to it because 153 is the number that represents the next dimension, the eternal dimension. 369 or the first day is belongs to this world, yes, but 153 is the heavenly, the eternal dimension is represented by 153. So 153 fish was not just a random number that John, you know, put in his, uh, <laughs> uh, put in the gospel. No, there was this deeper mathematical meaning to it. And this is how when the iterations move on, you'll see from the fifth day onwards, it is 153. It adds up to 153 for eternity. Eighth day, ninth day, tenth day, eleven day, thousand and fifteenth day, whatever, whatever, to eternity. So that is the significance of the 153 in John 21 11. Now there's another interesting reference from Dunn. Early Christianity was called the way, okay, the way, all right, in Jesus' time and in apostolic times. So after Jesus was, uh, he died at the cross, he was resurrected and then he uh, ascended, right? Now after that, the apostolic, uh, sorry, the ap apostolic times are when the apostles uh, from the time Jesus ascended to the time the last apostle passed away was called the apostolic times, okay? It was represented by the symbology of fish. The Greek word for fish is ichthys, okay? As early as the first century, Christians made an acrostic from this word, all right? It was in Greek, okay? So ichthys is fish, and if you make an acrostic, this is what they wrote, Jesus Christos, Theo Eos Soter, or Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. And you know fish has plenty of other theological overtones as well. For Christ fed the 5,000 with the two fishes and one five loaves, and then another 4,000 with seven loaves and a few small fish. He called his disciples fishers of men. Water baptism practiced by immersion in the early church also created a parallel between fish and converts. And this is, um, you know, an early Christian symbol of the way which was found etched in the floor, you know, on the floor of an ancient church or ecclesia, all right, in Greece. So you can see that the fish has been etched. This is, uh, it was, Christianity was called the way, and it was symbolized by fish, which is again connected to 153, the full net, right? So anyway, let's move on. I thought I'd share this very interesting. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so. Now, did you know that in verse 24, the word creature, okay, every living creature is uh, H315, nefesh, meaning with soul. Now, in Hebrew, with soul means uh, that which is present in each self-conscious life, as opposed to, let's say, a stone or a piece of metal, okay, or a piece of chalk that has no attribution of self-consciousness. Now, all of God's living creations or creatures, humans, animals, bird, fish, bird, fish, and even uh, the creepy crawlies, okay, they all have an afesh, okay, we all have an afesh. A created, God-given self-consciousness, which enables them and us to live, to breathe and move, eat and survive, and even defend themselves in a hostile environment. So that is called nefesh. When it says creature, it means self-conscious life. You know, it's life. It's a soul. It's life, meaning with soul, with a self-consciousness. Okay. And God made the beast of the earth after its kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. Again, DNA. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now this verse, these three verses, 
so much study has been done on it i tell you but uh, i'll give you what i found in hebrew right that the word image used here like he said let us create them in our image now i believe this is the trinity speaking okay there is a, a three pronged uh, this like I, I've always believed that there's Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe the Father is speaking to the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then He says, "Let us create them in our image." Okay. Now the word image, all right. In this context, the word is H six seven five four. It means Salem. All right. Uh, it means in this context a representative figure of His authority, God's heart to eventually build a dwelling place for Himself on earth began through his creation of man and woman and was intended to manifest his character, his essence, his, his salem, his character, his goodness and his authority and display his indisputable power over the works of darkness. You know, Hoshek, the darkness which was the sole previous occupant of earth before man was created. Remember Tohu Bohu and Hoshek, a complete uh, chaos, disorderliness complete destruction, complete, uh, you know, it was completely, you remember, we went through the study of Tohu, Bohu, and Hoshek, meaning there was complete misery, and it represents so many things, right? Like complete, utter destruction, annihilation, right? So after all that, after, after darkness had done whatever it had wanted to, which, and was the sole previous occupant of the earth before man was created, God said, let us create man in our image, in his salem, his essence. Okay. And he to display his indisputable power over the works of darkness. This is very important. This is what I get when I read when I read this in Hebrew. This is what comes to me. Okay. And God blessed them, okay, man and woman. And God said to unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. So now, do you know that all beings, including men, were vegetarians before the flood? So these two verses explain that, right? Uh, Genesis 1, 29-30. But God later blessed mankind to become non-vegetarian in the post diluvian world, which is the world post-flood, right? In Genesis 9.3 and in Deuteronomy 12.15, we see that. Now, I remember watching a preacher called Ray Comfort, and he was, um, he was suddenly confronted by this um, Hindu sadhu. And that Hindu man, he said that, uh, you know, doesn't your good book say that thou shall not kill and yet you Christians eat meat? You people have meat, dairy products. I mean, aren't you breaking your own uh, God's commandments by doing that? It does say thou shall not kill. And I found Ray Comfort was a little stumped by that. And later, of course, he went on to say, oh, it's all demonic doctrines and that. But I was shouting at my computer screen. I was saying, Ray, tell him about Genesis 9, 3 and Deuteronomy 12, 15. God has blessed us. Okay, God has blessed man and said, you can eat meat, you can have dairy products. It is, we're not going against God's law. No Christian has broken God's law in this matter. You, God has blessed us to be non-vegetarians. Check Genesis 9.3. Tell him about Deuteronomy 12.15. Don't stand quiet. Refute any allegations such as this with scripture. Okay, so anyway, that was just, I just went off track here. Let's get back. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, nefesh, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. He had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So man was created on the sixth day. Okay. Now we come to Genesis 2. All right. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, his huge work of creation, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work. Sorry about the traffic sound. I'm really sorry. This is a mountain town, tourist town. I don't know what these people are doing at this time in the night, but whatever. <laughs> and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because that... In it, he had rested from all his work, 
which God created and made. Now, did you know that the seventh day is Shabi'i, the root word for Shabbat, which was ordained by God to be a day of rest and communion with the Lord's Spirit? This God built the seven-day week into the order of this world. Now, you know, wherever you go in the world, it doesn't matter what language, what culture, what religion, anywhere you go in the world, everybody has a seven-day week. It is irrefutable. You go anywhere, you go to China, go to Indonesia, go to or anywhere, you know, go to the far-flung islands somewhere. They all have a seven-day week. And this is something that has been incorporated into man's, I think, subconscious from the beginning of time, that there is a seven-day week, okay? Of course, everybody does it differently. Some people uh, started on Friday. I mean, the, the, the Shabbat starts on Friday. For some people, it starts on Saturday. So for some people, it starts on Sunday. But that's not the point. The point is there is a seven-day week. So anyway, these are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, every herb of the field before it grew, and for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. So did you know that it did not rain on earth from the day creation began up until Noah's flood started? Okay, this is really amazing to most people. That it's true that, there, you know, God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. All right? But... There went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So that is how all these plants and all were sustained. And there was no rain, but there was a mist. There went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. So he made this beautiful garden, okay, the Garden of Eden, Yan Eden. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So did you know that in verse 9, the tree of life is called Edzachayim, Sorry, it's a haim. Okay, the ch. Whenever you see ch in Hebrew, the c is silent. It's a haim in Hebrew. From the root word two four one six hai. Okay, hai meaning life or life life giving. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Now this is very interesting. Then one life-giving river flowed out from Eden and it divided into four life-giving rivers, Pison, Gion, Hedekel, Euphrates, and that watered the entire earth, right? This also seems to suggest that at this point in time, Pangea or Pangea or Gaia, whatever you, you know, however you say it, existed. Okay, it was one landmass, a time before the singular large landmass broke up, broke up and became different continents and all. Because you see, if a river originates in Africa and it breaks into four, you know, rivers, it can hardly water Australia or South America, okay, or Asia, because there are seas in the middle right now, right? But this clearly tells us that one river flowed out from Eden and divided into four life-giving rivers. Let's read this again. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. All right? The name of the first is, it's Pison or Pison, I don't know. Uh, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havila, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is bedellium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is that in, that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hedekel, which that is that is it which goes towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now this is why most uh, theologians and uh, rabbinic scholars believe that the Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, was in the Middle East because Euphrates is still there. The other rivers we don't know exactly which river. Because it was all one landmass, you see, because from one Eden, from Gan Eden, the river flowed and broke out into four, you know, four different rivers and they watered the entire earth. So it's evident that if 
if a river starts in Middle East, it cannot possibly water Australia or South America or Africa. You know, it's this was one landmass when this this was happening, right? So anyway, so now you have, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So Adam or Adam was the first gardener, okay, which I find so nice because we still to this day, human beings, we love gardens, we love gardening, we love flowers and plants. It comes from our forefather, Adam, okay, he was a gardener by profession. So, if, uh, so he put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, did you know that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Hebrew is read as Etz Hadat Tovara? Okay, because the art is the knowledge. Good is tov, evil is ra. Now, in my studies, I realized that in Hebrew, both the word for knowledge and science share the same root, okay? It's your dalet alef, both the words, okay? And also the word, the Hebrew word for information, maida, it also contains your dalet alef or the knowledge of science. Therefore, is it possible? I mean, this is what I understood that it is possible that this refers to the technology of creation, the deep mysteries of biology or DNA and manipulation of DNA. Okay, In this context, we see that good and evil per se was not the bone of contention here, but it was the untimely knowledge of this science that led to the fall and the curse upon all creation in this realm. I'm telling you this, when you go deeper into Hebrew, when you read the Bible in Hebrew, so much of this, like science, knowledge, information. So this is like God saying that you don't need this information right now. You can get it later, but this is, don't eat from this tree. Don't, don't seek after this knowledge of good and evil or of this creation because this is like the deepest mysteries. Don't go after it because it's not the right time. You don't put a gun into a five-year-old's hands, right? And expect no consequences. And that is why God, in his love and his mercy, he had told Adam that don't, you know, whatever you do, don't don't go there. Don't eat that, all right? That's not for you, especially not, not at this time. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him, like a partner for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought, him, brought them into, unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever, whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So there's the Lord God, there's Adam sitting there, and every creature coming to Adam, and Adam is naming them. I just find this so cute, okay? It's, it's just so, so heartwarming. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found any help meet for him, okay? Evidently, the dog wasn't his best friend. <laughs> he needed a partner. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in, instead thereof. This is the Lord God being the universal anesthetist, the surgeon, okay, and the molecular biologist. I'll tell you why. Did you know that here again in this verse, we get a glimpse of advanced molecular biology and science. Now that we know through mankind's own advanced technology of gene manipulation that stem cells are, the, are primarily found in human bone marrow and stem cells are the main biological matter from which another living being can be created, such as a clone, okay? Stem cells are also used to grow new organs in laboratories. And what's amazing is that bone marrow is primarily found in the ribs of adults. Apart from the vertebrae, sternum, and bones of the pelvis. Sternum is this central central bone that, that holds the ribs together, the central bone. Okay, that's the sternum. But the ribs, okay, this is this is the interesting part where the fact that it can be that bone marrow can be extracted from the ribs without giving too much trauma to the patient is absolutely amazing. And explains totally as to why God chose stem cells from Adam's ribs to create the woman. Do you get it? Do you see that? Isn't that brilliant? And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, the stem cells that he had taken, made he a woman 
and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. He was so thrilled. He was like, finally, I get a partner. Yay, my soulmate, my partner. Okay, so she shall be called woman. Now this word is Isha in Hebrew, because she was taken out of man, Ish. Okay, now, did you know, now this is a funny story. Did you know that the great reformer Martin Luther, who started his Christian journey as a monk and later married an ex-nun named Katerina von Bora, always referred to his beloved wife with affectionate humor as Kitty, my rib. <laughs> now this is based obviously on Genesis 2.22, but imagine going about calling your wife Kitty, my rib, or so and so, my rib. Linda, my rib, Parvati, my lip. You know, it's like it's just it's just funny, okay? Uh, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. It was a time of great innocency, like almost like the childhood of mankind, okay? The innocency of mankind, great innocency and great. Uh, there was no there was no guilt there was no shame nothing okay so this was a great this was a time of innocence so i'll just pause now and i'll come back okay because i've been talking non-stop right how we come to genesis 3 now the serpent was more subtle more cunning than any beast of the field which the lord god had made and he said unto the woman Yea, hath God said that ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, did you know this word serpent? Okay, in Hebrew, it is 5175 Nahash. Okay, Nahash. It refers directly in Hebrew to a serpent. And I have studied with many um, rabbinical, um, you know, uh, um, sort of literature. I've gone through rabbinical literature and they say it's a serpent. It's a snake. Okay. But also in this context, E.W. Bullinger wrote, and I paraphrase this, that the Nahash was the shining one, okay? And he goes on to say that we cannot, con we cannot conceive Eve as holding a conversation with a snake, but we can understand her being fascinated by an angel of light, a glorious angel possessing superior and supernatural knowledge. Now that we can understand, right? I mean, you wouldn't generally, typically hold a conversation with a snake, right? It is remarkable that the verb Nahash always means to enchant, fascinate, beguile. And remember, Eve does say that the serpent beguiled me, okay? So it means to enchant, fascinate, beguile, or of one having and using occult knowledge. Other extra-biblical references point out that in Genesis 3.1, Nahash means the shining one, and the word finds its roots in ancient Chaldee, where it means shining brass or copper. Now the word Nehushtan in 2 Kings 18.4 comes from this. Now Nehushtan was the name given to the brazen serpent that Moses had made upon God's instruction in Numbers 21.8.9. Remember when the Israelites were in the wilderness and they were, as usual, moaning, groaning, groaning and you know, grumbling against Moses and God, and why you brought us here, did you bring us here to die, and so on and so forth. And God had sent uh, fiery serpents, and the serpents started biting them, and they started dying. Now, the Israelites, um, at that point, when they were dying, the Israelites started saying that, uh, you know, like, Moses, help us, help us, we're all like, you know, we're getting bitten and we're dying, so... Moses went into prayer and went into the presence of the Lord and said, please help us. And the Lord said, okay, put a pole, okay, make a pole and put a brazen serpent, a serpent made of brass on that pole. And anytime anyone gets bit by any serpent, all they have to do is look at the pole and they will not die. They will be saved, which is like, you know, a foreshadowing of the cross. If you look at it that way. Because remember in Isaiah, he says, all you have to do is look, just look upon the cross and you shall be saved. Okay, so this is what uh, the word Nahash is the shining one because um, again, in ancient Shali, right? So Nahash means it's the shining one because in that ancient language, it means shining brass or copper. 
and the word Nehushtan in Second Kings 18:4 comes from this. All right. Again, in Second Corinthians 11:3, I found that Paul says he fears that the Corinthians would be deceived by the serpent in the same way that Eve was. Now it is evident here that he does not think that Eve is going to be I mean that the Corinthians will be deceived by an actual snake that comes out to them, right? But by Hasatan or the adversary. And 11 verses later in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, Paul reinforces this by saying that Hasatan is an angel of light. So we can be sure that Paul evidently understood and taught that the serpent, the harsh and the shining one are one and the same. So they say, be careful, right? If this angel of light appears in front of you and, you know, it could be Hasatan, it could be the adversary, right? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat. Remember the serpent asked her, like, did God really say hmm, that you can not eat anything? And the woman said unto the serpent, no, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Okay, now, that, you know, did you know that planting doubt in God's word, did God really say, okay? or has God really said this, is an active tactic of the adversary to this day, prompting believers to question and doubt God's unchanging word. And that Eve's response in Genesis 3.3 is considered the first lie in the Bible, because God never said, ye shall never touch it. You know, it is so um, important for us to realize this, because when we even slightly change God's word, right, all Satan has to do in this scenario, I can picture it, okay, he's standing next to Eve, and he's asking her these questions and she said, no, God said, you know, uh, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And all Satan has to do is give her a nudge, you know, and she falls against the tree and she touches it and she doesn't die, right? That's all he has to do in this scenario. And the serpent said unto the woman, and I feel it was after he nudged her and she fell against the tree <laughs> and she touched it and she didn't die, okay? And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And you know, this is the tactic used by, used in every occult tradition. Okay, they say, oh, do your meditation, let your chakras open up, and your third eye will open up, and you'll know everything there is to know. This is used till this day. So beware of new age religion. This is what happened to Eve and she fell for it. Don't even by mistake fall for such things. Okay. And if someone is into a cult in your family or among your friends, right, just send them this video. Let them let them read the Bible for themselves. And I'm explaining it in the Hebrew, you know, from the Hebrew, from the original language. And this is exactly what it means. All right. So, and when the woman, so Satan does this, right? So, uh, he says that ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. God never said, you know, God never told, told them, don't ever partake of it, okay? Because on the day you will, you'll die, all right? Because it was untimely knowledge, as I mentioned before. They weren't supposed to because, as I said, you don't put a handgun into the hands of a five-year-old, all right? Nothing good can come of it, okay? But when Satan prompted her, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, it was attractive, okay, this word here is attractive, it was very desirable, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, again, isn't that what all of a cult teaches? Come open your third eye and become wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, Adam was with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, the end of the age of innocence. Okay, whereas chapter 2 ends with, you know, how beautiful it was. They were both naked and they didn't care, they didn't, they didn't mind because there was so much innocency. They were like children. But this is the end of innocence. Okay. The moment they did what God told them expressly not to do. 
Now, did you know that many Jewish rabbis claim that the forbidden tree was a fig tree because of verse 7? Okay, what is verse 7? That they've sewed fig leaves together, right? And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons to hide their nakedness. So they figured that since the fruit of the tree had opened their eyes to their nakedness, the leaves of that very tree could cover the same. Now, early Christians who relied on Latin Bible translations thought it was an apple tree. Because as it turned out, the Latin word for evil, melum, sounds almost the same as the Latin word for apple, malum. So that's how Christians who read the Latin Bible thought it was an apple tree. As the words for evil and apple in Latin are almost the same. Isn't that amazing? And there's something else I have to show you. And now, does that remind you of a certain tech company hmm? whose logo is this? But I know that they do say that it's based on Isaac Newton and the apple that led to the discovery of gravity. But clearly, there's a bite taken out of this apple. Clearly. I mean, think about it. After all, when the fallen angels give you the technology, they will leave their mark upon it. I mean, that's just... A spiritual law, isn't it? Anyway, just ponder upon it. I'm not saying it is, but it's a possibility. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Oh, this this verse brings up such imagery in my mind. Okay, you can picture the Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, beautiful big trees everywhere, right? And you have these trees and you can see, uh, you know, sunlight filtering in through the leaves and the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. It just such imagery. I, I come to this verse every time I'm feeling a little disconnected from God and I just come here, I read this and I feel connected with him again. Okay, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. <laughs> this is again like Comedy Central, right? I mean, there's this omnipresent creator who created you. And you think you can hide behind a tree trunk from him. Like, you can't even hide your intentions or your thoughts from him, right? So they hid behind the trees, among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where are you? And he said from behind a tree, like, you know, when my daughter was like two or three, she would hide behind the curtains and I would say, oh my God, I can't see you. Where are you? Where are you? And I would hear a voice from behind the curtain saying, I'm not here. I'm not here. <laughs> this reminds me of that. <laughs> okay. So Adam says, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou were naked? Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not shouldest not eat? Like I told you, don't eat from that. Did you eat from there? And the man said, The woman you whom you thou gavest to be with me, the woman you gave me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So now there's a comedy of errors where you know everybody's passing on the buck to everybody else, like God is God is asking Adam, did you eat it? And he was like, the woman you gave me? The woman? That woman? She made me and I ate it. Okay. But before we get to the next comedy of errors, let's go through this. Did you know that Adam's response in Genesis 3.12 of passing on the buck to Eve has been greatly criticized by theologians over the past 21 centuries? But in 1 Timothy 2.14, it gives us a deeper insight that Adam was not deceived but he realized that the love of his life, his soulmate, the love of his life, Eve, was in some serious trouble. And instead of just abandoning her to her fate, he wanted to stay by her side and face whatever punishment was in their future together, for better or for worse. You know, when, when we take Christian vows of marriage, we say for richer, for poorer, in sickness or in health, for better or for worse, this is where it started. So Adam knew she had she had goofed up big time. Adam knew it. And he was like, oh, oh, she's in for it. But she is my soulmate. She is my other half. 
she's my flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. How can I just let her, you know, face it alone? So he ate the apple too, not the apple, but whatever, the fruit of the forbidden tree, right? Let's not be Latin inspired and say it was an apple. So then the further thing happens, right? And the Lord God, so God had asked Adam, did you eat it? And he was like, the woman you gave me, she made me eat it. Okay, and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, Ah, the serpent beguiled me. The serpent beguiled me and I ate. And I did eat. So it wasn't me, it was the serpent who made me do it. Okay, so Adam's like, It was the woman you gave me. And Eve is like, Ah, it was the serpent that beguiled me. Okay, and I did eat. <sighs> and then comes the fall of mankind, the curses. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, the bug finally stopped at the serpent. He had no excuse. Okay, he 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 couldn't pass the bug on to anyone. He was just standing there, probably, hopefully, looking ashamed, or maybe not. Who knows? And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, did you know that this was Genesis 3.15, okay, is considered the first messianic prophecy in the Bible. When God speaks of putting enmity between the serpent's seed and her seed. Yes, it's almost impossible and totally unusual for a woman to have seed. As it is always the seed of a man that brings forth a child, isn't it? Unless... Unless the woman happens to be a virgin with a child. As is given to us in Isaiah 7.14 and then repeated in Matthew 1.23. The prophecy of the coming King Jesus who would be born to a virgin. And this also later translates to the open enmity between the worldly elite. The seed of the serpent. Okay, Clearly the serpent has a seed. And I honestly think that it's the worldly elite. Because... Uh, the serpent is called the Rahash, the shining one, is also called the prince of this world, as given in John 12, 31, 14, 13, 14, 30, 16, 11, Ephesians 2, 2, and 2 Corinthians 4, 4. There are so many places where he is called the prince of this world, okay? Like even Jesus says that now the prince of this world is here and I don't have long, all right? And their open persecutions, who the seed of the serpent, and their open persecutions against those who are born again believers in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of this world. Sure, we'll get persecuted. That's fine, isn't it? I mean, we weren't promised a great life on this earth, right? All our promises, our true promises, are in the heavenly realms, right? So in this world, we, we do the Lord's work as long as it's day, because the night is coming. When we can no longer work. Remember Layala, night and adversity. So so that's what it is. So the enmity started from this verse. Okay, this is the first messianic prophet, uh, prophecy and also the open enmity between the worldly elite, the seed of the serpent, right? And well, the followers of Christ. Christ came from the seed of the woman, born to a virgin. Now, also, the first occurrence of the word head, okay, is in this word, is in this verse, sorry. You know, when he says that uh, um, it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel, right? Now, the first occurrence of the word head is in this verse. And uh, Rosh, okay, the, the word for head is Rosh, which is strong 7218, can mean chief, it can mean prince, ruler, or even a beginning, as in, you know, Rosh Hashanah the head of the year or the beginning of the year, that also finds its roots here. Now, verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, did you know that this is why women have been oppressed by men since time immemorial? Now, in fact, in certain Middle Eastern and Eastern and tribal countries and cultures today, even today, 
women begin life as the property of their fathers okay so then on marriage they become the property of their husbands then when the on the husband's passing they become property of their sons they're treated like cattle basically their property they have no rights of their own and women have been fighting for emancipation for emancipation and against such oppression for centuries fact is it was only in the last century that women were even given the right, right to vote even even the right to have a profession to earn professionally it's only that's only happened recently it's only in the last century after centuries and centuries of oppression right but it did not start out that way in the garden of eden woman was created to be a partaker of all blessings given to adam and to be his other half that equation changed dramatically after the fall and you must remember that we are all still living in a fallen world and this oppression and injustice and abuse that many women face even today even in western cultures even in you know so called civilized cultures there's a lot of uh, abuse domestic abuse and mental abuse and there's gaslighting and all kinds of things okay that women face even today now this is a direct result of the curse on the woman in genesis 3:16 that's not to say that we cannot or should not fight against such injustice inequality or abuse but this is just to give the bewildered and saddened souls of women in such situations a background as to how and why this came to be in our world when we see such situations it saddens us all men women both children it just saddens us that this is happening but this is how it came to be okay so that's the background that's the curse in genesis 3:16 and unto adam he said because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and has eaten of the tree of which i commanded thee saying thou shall not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of the life of thy life thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of thy face and thou shall eat bread it's not going to be easy for you to eat any more that's basically what the lord is telling him till thou return unto the ground for out of it was thou taken for dust thou art and unto dust shall shall thou return dust to dust ashes to ashes there's no more eternal life there's no more all the good stuff is gone now okay so now we are cataloging the curses right so number 1 is a curse on the nahash the shining one of the serpent right that's in 30, uh, genesis 3:14 to 15 the curse on the woman as i mentioned that is there in genesis 3:15 to 16 the curse on the man genesis 3:17 to 19 the curse on all of nature do you realize that all of nature was cursed under the process cursed is the ground for thy sake the god the god told adam cursed is the ground for thy sake in genesis 3:17 and you know paul makes it a point to say in romans 8:22 and 23 For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, like all of creation, okay, is groaning in pain until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body, waiting for the blessed hope, right? So these curses. they changed the whole world they changed everything that was not how it was meant to be okay we're living in the fallen world any here any how so this is uh, the catalog of the curses and then and adam called his wife's name eve because she was the mother of all living now this can sound cryptic in english but in hebrew it's very simple that in genesis 321 adam named his wife eve or in hebrew eve is written as hava okay but like c h a v v a h but pronounced as hava which means life and is a derivative from life giver so hava or eve is was named as such for it is through her that human children were first born on earth and still it is through the woman right no matter how many gender benders come along it's always going to be the the woman who gives birth the woman who has children right unto adam also and to his wife did the lord god make coats of skins and clothed them now after they had goofed up big time okay they had disappointed the lord god so much the lord god makes 
and they've sown fig leaves okay the lord god loves them so much the father loves them so much he makes them coats of skin and clothes them it's like how you clothe your little children right who don't know how to clothe themselves that's what god did for adam and eve he made coats of skins animal skins and clothed them now did you know that in genesis 3:21 innocent animals were killed so that god could provide clothing or a covering for adam and eve there is a foreshadowing of the coming savior and the modus operandi that god will use for saving people in a fallen world a blood covenant where substitutionary atonement is provided by judgment upon the innocent and sinless in this case christ the lamb of god he was judged for our sins judgment upon the innocent and sinless so that the guilty we us can go free as the blood of christ becomes our covering this is a foreshadowing of that genesis 3:21 verse 22 and the lord god said behold the man is become as one of us to know good and evil and now lest he put forth his hand and also take on and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever because if you ate from the tree of life you would have eternal life okay therefore the lord god sent him forth he sent adam away okay sent him forth from the garden of eden to till the ground from whence he was taken from outside the garden of eden so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of eden cherubims okay east of the garden this is the eastern gate of eden ganim okay and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life so that adam or eve could not or any of the descendants could not partake of the tree of life now did you know that cherubim are the created angelic beings assigned to god the throne of god they are considered as powerful military angels okay jewish rabbinical literature tells us that they are cherubim are powerful military angels the exact opposite of the chubby baby angels that are called cherubs or cherubs in popular culture right so they're nothing like the cherubs you see they're actually military powerful huge military angels okay they guard the throne of god they also guard the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat see exodus 25:18 to 22 and 37:7-9 cherubim which is plural uh, which is plural for cherub guarded the east gate of the garden of eden to keep man from entering and partaking of the tree of life why why did god want to stop man or any of his descendants from partaking of the tree of life okay why so this is the answer because in his fallen sinful state had man partaken from the tree of life he would have had to live forever in permanent estrangement from his creator from god and in estrangement from god's mercy for eternity you never want to be in that place never so out of god's great mercy and understanding of how we were so childlike and you know we didn't know what was good for us he made sure that at least we can't live for an eternity in that state okay we have a short life on earth we die if we have come back to god if we have repented we go on to the heavenly realms and we have a home with him there till everything moves to earth like the renewed heaven and the renewed the renewed earth right so now about the cherubim the complete uh, description of the cherubim may be found in Ezekiel 10 where the cherubim have a part in the glory of God its presence and its withdrawal they move at the almighty's command also take a look at Psalms 90 99 verse 1 right so now we come to Genesis 4 i don't know how long this video is going to be <laughs> i thought it'd be over in like half an hour anyway and adam knew eve his wife that is he biologically knew her and she conceived and bare Cain and said i have gotten a man from the lord and she again bare his brother abel and abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was the tiller was a tiller of the ground so basically abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer and in the process in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground as an offering unto the lord and abel he also brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof and the lord had respect unto abel and to his offering but unto cain and to his offering he had not respect and cain was very wroth very angry and his countenance fell 
Now, did you know why God rejected Cain's offering? Because Cain made the offering with an impure heart. See Hosea 6.6, 6, Amos, read Amos 5.21 to 24, read Micah 6 to 6, 8, especially Micah 6, 8, uh, Micah 6 verse 8 to get a better understanding of what Cain's short, shortcoming really was. Now, this is important. So, I'm actually going to bring it up on the screen and read it to you. So, here it is. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So let's read this again. He has shown you a mortal what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So that is what Micah, when I said this relates to Cain, I'll come back to that. So now you will see, right, that Cain, he didn't walk humbly. He didn't have mercy. He was, he was not a merciful man. And he didn't walk humbly before his God, right? And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, when you read this in Hebrew, it just sends shivers up your spine. Because what? Sin lieth at the door. I mean, what does it mean? In verse 7, when you read it in Hebrew, it literally translates to Rabats. Okay? Now, what is Rabats? Rabats is a crazed demon who is crouching on all fours at the door like a rabbit animal ready to pounce. Now, remember in 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter says that, you know, your adversary is like a roaring lion just waiting to pounce. That's Rabats. And so it happened. Cain gave in to his demonic thoughts. And in verse 8, we see the first murder in the Bible, right? And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against, his, against Abel, his brother, and slew him. He just murdered him in the fields. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy, bro thy brother? And you know, Cain responds, and he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> like, you know, talk about lack of humility, lack of truth, talk about lack of, you know, forget being humble, there's no mercy in this man. And you remember, that is what Micah 6, 8 talks about. That's what God wants from us. He wants mercy. He wants, he wants us to walk mercifully and humbly. And none of that was in Cain. Okay. So when the Lord asked, where is Abel thy brother? Cain just shrugs his shoulders as meh. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? With the arrogance of the man. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now, did you know that blood can cry out? Now, Leviticus 17.11 tells us that all life is in the blood. Hence, when blood is spilled, the one who gives us life can hear its cry. Amazing. And now, and now art thou cursed from this God speaking to Cain. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Sorry, that's my dog. A fugitive and a vagabond, and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. And Cain, Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. That's when the morning and groaning starts. He's not at all, you know, he's not at all sad that he killed his brother. He's sad that he got, got caught. Okay. He's sad that someone caught him at it and that to the Lord God. And now he's being punished for his crime. Like most people who get punished, you know, they're, not, they're not really sad that they committed the crime. They're sadder. I mean, they're actually sad because they got caught. Okay. So now his morning and groaning starts. 
Behold, thou hast driven me from this day, from the face of the earth, and from the fa from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in this earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Because back then, there was a sense of, uh, you know, justice, wherein if a man killed another man, that man, you know, needed to be put to death. There was a sense of justice on this earth. There were people on the earth, okay? It was not just Adam, Eve, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. There were more people on the earth. It was... There were, there were more people. There are a lot of extra biblical references that says at about the time this happened, the earth was already quite populated. Okay. I won't go into that because there are extra biblical references. Let's just stick to Genesis. Right. But anyway, and the Lord, you know, this mark that was put on Cain was obviously a physical mark that others could see. It was not just a spiritual mark. Right. So anyway, uh, so the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. Now, did you know that uh, Nod is a play on the Hebrew word Nod, which means to wander, to be a nomad, a nomad, and be restless forever. Like someone without any rest, who is always moving around, is called Nod, right? And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, again, this is a biological knowing, and bare Enoch, and he built a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, Irad begat uh, Mehuael, Mehuael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. Mm. That was Ada and Zillah, right? So this is about Lamech, actually. Um, so Lamech is another... Another guy, another murderer, just like Cain, okay? And uh, Lamech said unto his wife, Ada and Zillah, Hear my wife, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my herd. And if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. There's so much arrogance, okay? There's no mercy for others. There's no humility. They're not walking in uh, mercy and humbleness in front of God, right? So, did you know that Lamech turned out to be another detestable murderer? Just like his forefather Cain. As they say, the apple doesn't fall far, far from the tree, right? So, that was that story. And Adam knew his wife again, biologically, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, had appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also, was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So did you know that after a great deal of unrighteousness, there was a return or a resurgence of righteousness on earth with the birth of Seth's son, Enosh. Now verse 26 tells us that. Okay. So now we'll move on to Genesis 5. Before that, I'll take another break. My voice is cracking. Oh, this is hard, Lord. And now we come to the final chapter of today's study, this Thursday study, that's Genesis 5. Now this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam or Adam in Hebrew. In the day when they were created. Now did you know that there is a coded message in Genesis 5? That the Hebrew names of the first ten generations spell out a message, and it happens to be the same message of the gospel revealed in the New Testament. As it is said, the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament fulfilled. Okay, now all of it hasn't been fulfilled yet until we reach Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So it says, And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, and after his image, and called his name Seth. Now, the ten generations, these coded messages in the names, were given by Chuck Missler. That's where I got it from. Okay. So, Adam is man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means miserable or mortal. Canaan means sorrow. 
Mahalalel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means commencing teaching. Methuselah means his death or end shall bring. Lamech means the despairing in tribulation. Noah means comfort. So if you read them all together, it means man is appointed miserable mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching and his death or his end shall bring the despairing those in tribulation comfort. Okay, that is the message of the gospel. But do you know that three years ago, the Holy Spirit took me deeper into it and there is a further message. There's a coded message hidden in Genesis 5. So this even there's an even deeper hidden message when we decode the ages at paternity, lifespan after paternity, age at death of the first 10 generations in the Bible, interspersed by their worst numbers given in Genesis 5, because Hebrew is an alphanumeric language and so is Greek by the way. The message when decoded in Hebrew strongs reads as follows, to flow down my unconditional love and harvest with unconditional love and comfort my precious stones. So in all of, I'm not going to read out the whole of Genesis 5, but essentially, like, for example, you have Enosh lived 90 years and begat Canaan. So there's their lifespan, okay, their number of years at paternity. Then number of the paternity. So Enosh lived 800 after he begat Canaan, lived 815 years, okay, and all the days of Enosh, and there's the there's the age of death, right? Like the, the he all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. And same similarly with Canaan, okay? Like his um uh, as, as I mentioned, you know that uh, the where was I? Why am I so confused? I've been talking for ages, right? So the ages at paternity, lifespan after paternity, age at death, all this is given in Genesis 5 for the first 10 generations. Now we know that their names spell out the gospel, right? The gospel truth, hmm? which is uh, that, you know, what I just read out, that man is appointed miserable mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down teaching, and his, the God's death, his death and end shall bring the despairing, it shall bring the despairing or those in tribulation comfort. Okay, but this message is taken. What I did was I, I did an Excel sheet. Okay, so before we go there, I wanted to show you that all this is there, but there is a hidden code in it. Okay, but here let's go to this verse. Okay, and all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Now, this is very mysterious. It's like the first rapture in the Bible, right? The first, uh, you know, he was caught up to God. Now, did you know that according to ancient Jewish rabbinical literature, Enoch was born and taken up by God mysteriously on Shavuot? So he was born on Shavuot and he was taken up by God mysteriously on Shavuot. He didn't die. He was, he walked with God. He was taken up by God on Shavuot or the Jewish Jewish Pentecost, which the Jews celebrate on 6th of Sivan every year on the Jewish calendar. I thought that was an interesting little bit to share with you. Okay. Now, again, in this verse, um, this is about Lamech. Okay. And he called his son's name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Now, did you know why Lamech said in verse 29 that the same Noah shall comfort us? Because Noah's mean, uh, sorry, Noah's name means comfort. Okay, Noah means comfort in Hebrew, while Lamech means despair. Like he's had a hard time and his son, he names him Noah because it's part of the gospel, isn't it? The, the God is going to bring us comfort. Okay, the despairing comfort. So Lamech says, Noah is going to bring me comfort. So these are the first 10 generations and these are the codes. So you have age at paternity, you have the Genesis verse like Adam, his age at paternity was 130 years. This is given in verse 5-3 of Genesis. Then lifespan after paternity, paternity was 800 years and this is given in verse 5-4 of Genesis. Then death at uh, age at death, sorry, is 930 years 
and this is given in Genesis verse 5 5 right so similarly for all of the 10 generations I put it in an excel sheet okay just to see what I would get okay it was completely a holy spirit driven study this was about three years ago and you know what I found I found that when you add the add this the aged paternity even the verse and the verse skips okay like for example between Seth and Enos between their uh, aged paternity there are three verses so I added the verse skips also okay and this gave an incredible message so 1556 in Hebrew Strong's is Galal or to flow down okay verse skips gives 26 now the you know 26 is the number of your hey wow hey the tetragrammaton the father the creator okay now we know from John that God is love okay not just any kind of love he's unconditional love agape okay so I put agape there instead of yod hey wav hey because 26 is yod hey wav hey and also agape okay in Greek so this gives us a multilingual message through the ages okay between Hebrew and Greek galal agape kaitis agape tankom odem so this is amazing galal is to flow down Okay, kaitis is harvest. Then we have tankum, comfort. And odem is precious stones. All right. So, in the table of, above, you'll find the hidden code in Genesis 5 to flow down my unconditional love and harvest with unconditional love and comfort my precious stones. It's there in Genesis 5. I just happened to be led to it by the Holy Spirit and I found it. Okay, so this code is very beautiful. And this is this coded message, okay? The same message that was hidden in code in Genesis 5 is later given to us in Malachi 3.17. And what does it read? And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, the Father. In the day when I make up my jewels, I will and I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him, or his own child. This word is actually child in Hebrew. So, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, when he wraps this whole thing up. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own child that serveth him. We serve a mighty father indeed, right? Now, I do hope that you've enjoyed this study. I know it's gone on for a while. I didn't think it'll take this long, but apparently the notes, the, my commentary is quite long. So, uh, well... I'm sure that you knew a lot of this, a lot of it that I presented today. I'm sure many of you knew a lot of it, but I'm sure a lot of things have come as a surprise and a, and a beautiful insight, right? So the whole idea of these studies on every Thursday is to give you mind-blowing insights, to draw you closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, okay? That is the whole point of these studies, all right? There's no dates, there's no date setting, there's nothing. This is just to bring you closer. And I hope that today's study has brought you closer not only to Father, our Creator, okay, but also to the Son and the Lord of our heart, Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, before before I go, I want to share something else with you. Uh, just a minute. And it's this. I've um, created a website for Pearl Colleri Publishing and it has all the, you know, it has different articles and I'm working on it. I'm creating blogs as well. And it has all these journals and things like that. And, you know, it lists all my books and journals. And oh, by the way, I am thinking of, uh, you know, compiling these notes because a lot of you may want these notes uh, and there'll be bite-sized notes. I'm going to put that up also. Okay, so if you want to support this channel, if you want me to continue doing what I'm doing and come up with studies which I will anyway every Thursday but if you enjoy the studies and you want to support this channel then pick up a journal or two <laughs> okay so that's all I have to say and I'll say goodbye for this week I'll be back on Thursday next with the next five chapters of Genesis and I'm sure you'll enjoy that as well Okay, so I'll take my leave now after a very long study and my voice is gone, <laughs> but I will take my leave now and uh, I'll say God bless you all and take care.